this very important meeting. Uh, my name is Mark. Audio Hill. recording for this meeting has begun. Oh, maybe I'll start over again. <laughs> uh, I want to say again, welcome everyone to the 181st meeting of BIFAD entitled Food Security and Nutrition in the Context of COVID-19 Impacts and Innovations. This is a very important topic, very important meeting, very important to BIFAD. And, and again, my name is Mark Keenum. I serve as chairman of BIFAD. And I'm honored to be here this afternoon to welcome all of you. And then I guess as a quick reminder to remind most of you understand and know what BIFAD is, but BIFAD is a presidentially appointed seven-member board. And it was established in 1975 in the uh, Food Assistance Act in Title 12. The role of BIFAD is to be an advisory body to the administrator and also to promote the interest of our U.S. Industry, uh, US universities and their role in supporting the mission of USAID. And I'm again very proud to be here to welcome all of you this afternoon and to be here with my colleagues my very distinguished colleagues who serve as members of the BIFAD board. And I would like to introduce them uh, at this time and allow them to introduce themselves for that matter. Maybe uh, Pamela Anderson, would you mind introducing yourself? Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pamela Anderson. I'm a BIFAD member and the former director general of the CGIAR's International Potato Center. Thank you, Pamela. Dr. Wadid Cruzado. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the board and um, to our wonderful uh, audience. My name is Wadid Cruzado. I'm president of Montana State University and honored to serve as a member of BIFAT. Thanks for having us here. Thank you, Wadid. Dr. Brady Deaton. Dr. Deaton, I, know, I heard your voice earlier. I know you're with us. You may be on mute. <laughs> okay. There you go. Okay, am I on now, Mark? You're here. Okay, great. Thanks. Sorry about that. Uh, welcome to the meeting this afternoon, everyone. And I'm Brady Deaton, Chancellor Emeritus at the University of Missouri and member of BIFAD. Thank you, Brady. Mr. Richard Lackey. Richard, are you with us? If you are, we can't hear you. Well, I'll go to my next colleague, uh, Mr. Jim Ash. Jim, are you with us? I am, Mark. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for attending today. I am, by background, a business attorney focusing in the food and agribusiness industry. I'm located in uh, Kansas City, Missouri. Thank you, Jim. Dr. Gabisa Ajeda. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. My name is Gabisa Ajeda, professor of plant breeding and genetics at Purdue University and Center of Global Food Security Director as well. Thank you. And I'm a member of the BIFAD board. Glad to be with you. Thank you, Gabisa. Well, again, I'm Mark Keenum. I'm serving, I'm honored to serve as chair of this outstanding board. I've been part of this board now for just over two years. And I also serve as president of Mississippi State University. It is an honor to be here with all of you and to be here with such distinguished colleagues on the BIFAD board. And for this afternoon, our primary purpose of this meeting is to, is to share the thinking of leading experts of the field of security and nutrition that relates to COVID-19 impacts. And that's a very timely topic, as we all know. The meeting will also help support decision making, we hope, for our USAID administration and, and all of its partners and stakeholders working to advance food security, nutrition, and resilience at global and regional national levels. And I will tell you that I'm very pleased that participation 
um, for our audience today. I'm very encouraged by the fact that we have more than 1,000 individuals who have registered for this for this meeting this afternoon. So I thank you all for participating. And I want to encourage all of you who are viewing this and watching this to participate in the meeting. And, and when you do, uh, to introduce yourselves and ask questions. And then also share your resources or comments on our chat box. And starting at 3.10 p.m. Eastern Time, we will take public comments and questions that have come in via the, our, our uh, webinar chat box. And participants can submit their questions at any time during the course of the proceedings. And our presenters will try to keep their responses as brief as possible so we can get to as many questions as we can. Also, please keep in mind that this, that this meeting is being recorded and, and uh, the recording, the transcript, and all the, the, the meeting minutes will be available on the USAID website as well as AgriLinks and the APLU website. Well, now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our USAID Acting Administrator, John Barsa, to help set the stage for this afternoon's discussion. Mr. John Barsa is the Acting USAID Administrator, and prior to assuming these duties and on April the 11th of this year, he was sworn in on June the 10th of 2019 as the Assistant Administrator for USAID's Bureau of Latin America and the Caribbean. Mr. Barsa comes to USAID from uh, the Department of Homeland Security where he led the DHS Office of Partnership and Engagement as the Acting Assistant Secretary and later as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary. In these roles, he oversaw DHS's coordination and collaboration with governors, mayors, and other intergovernmental partners, the private sector, the law enforcement community, and other key stakeholders. Mr. Barsa began his career at DHS in the Trump administration as special assistant to Secretary John Kelly. We're very honored to have you with us this afternoon, uh, Administrator Barsa. And with that, I will turn it to you. Thank you very much, Mark. I have to say, on the, uh, as I start off here, I share your enthusiasm by seeing the number of people participating in this meeting. And I'd like to echo Mark's comments, encouraging all of you to participate actively. I, uh, from, I come to my position with a healthy respect and understanding of what just BIFAD and this community brings in terms of assisting myself and other USAID leadership in some very complex uh, problem. So thank you for all you do. I echo Mark's uh, sentiments. Please participate. I'm heartened to see uh, so many uh, out here uh, attending and, and observing. In the interest of time, you have a packed agenda. Um, I have some prepared remarks. So I'm going to jump into remarks. I don't want to drag things out too much. So I want to start off by again thanking um, uh, Mark for the kind words and for BIFAD. We at USAID value greatly our partnership at BIFAD. Uh, the information and analysis you provide continually informs our decision-making processes. Um, Chairman Keenum, again, thank you for your tireless efforts to elevate the visibility of USAID's leadership in food security, resilience and nutrition, and for strengthening the partnership with the preeminent thought leaders in academia. This collaboration is needed now more than ever, particularly as we drive forward our response to COVID-19 and its diverse impacts around the world, and begin to think about what the world looks like beyond the pandemic. This audience knows far better than most that the global ramifications of COVID-19 extend far beyond the health sector. Social distancing, restrictions around the operation of commercial businesses, and other efforts to limit transmission of the virus have successfully flattened the curve, but they've also come at a great cost. Access to basic services have been disrupted. Businesses have been forced to furlough or lay off employees, reducing household incomes and putting essential items out of reach for many. Local and national government structures have buckled under the strain of trying to manage the full spectrum of the pandemic's impact. Perhaps most urgently, food security and nutrition indicators have deteriorated among many vulnerable populations, posing a serious risk to the hard-earned gains we've made in the fight against hunger and malnutrition. 
And while we often describe these as second order impacts of the pandemic, at USCID, they are a primary concern. Lives are at stake. Prior to COVID-19, 820 million people, or about 11% of the global population, struggled to feed themselves. 149 million children were experiencing delays in physical growth and development due to malnutrition. The challenges I've outlined will only exacerbate these numbers. For vulnerable communities already facing poverty and hunger, COVID-19 represents a fundamental threat to the way they feed their families. The food and agricultural industries play an essential function in developing economies. Not only are employment and income at stake, but so is the daily sustenance necessary for families to thrive, prosper, and live. The entirety of the pandemic's impact on the global economy remains to be seen. But have we seen time and time again, spikes in food prices or sudden loss of income can lead to widespread food insecurity. In many places, pervasive food insecurity often presages civil unrest and instability, which can then create a tragic feedback loop and severe with severe humanitarian consequences. Without timely, targeted, and meaningful interventions, the COVID-19 pandemic could propel an additional 148 million people into extreme poverty and subsequently food insecurity. This would roll the clock back seven years in terms of progress made in poverty reduction. The time to act is now. Our mission at USAID is to advance a more stable and prosperous world. We undertake this mission not only because Americans are the most generous and compassionate people in the world, but also because we, understood that we understand that American interests are closely linked to global stability and human well-being. The United States has demonstrated clear and decisive leadership in the global fight against COVID-19. Since the onset of the outbreak, the U.S. government has committed more than $1 billion in assistance from USAID and the State Department. Contributions from the American private sector, businesses, NGOs, and faith-based organizations account for an additional $4 billion. That's what we've come to call the All of America response. USAID's decades of experience have taught us that, like COVID-19, development challenges are rarely confined to one single, single sector. They are often spillover effects across all areas of our work. That understanding, embodied by the concepts of resilience and fragility, has prompted us to undertake a number of internal reforms aimed at strengthening our effectiveness in attacking multi-sectoral challenges and being more strategic in our thinking. We recently established our Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, or RFS, which many of you are helping us to operationalize. RFS will build resilient communities and reduce hunger, poverty, and malnutrition, and work hand in glove with our new Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance and Bureau for Conflict Prevention and Stabilization to respond to global crises in a strategic and integrated fashion. With this new structure, USAID is able to better mitigate and respond to the impacts of COVID-19 on food security, nutrition, and livelihoods. Through programs like Feed the Future Initiative, we are working to root out hunger and foster self-reliance, understanding that our partner countries want a hand up, not a hand out. For example, Sylvia Natakunda owns a yogurt company in Uganda called Farm Reap. With support of Feed the Future, Sylvia is pivoting her business to safely sell yogurt directly to customers without physical contact and using innovative social media marketing strategies to reach your customers in light of the country's nationwide curfew. USAID's assistance is making sure Sylvia can, cook, can put food on her family's table, invigorating, invigorating the private sector, and stimulating the Ugandan economy. Feed the Future is an All of America initiative drawing in partners from every corner of the U.S. to assist in ending hunger for good. It is rising to the challenge posed by the pandemic by adapting programs and partnerships to mitigate its impact on food systems and nutrition. Supplemental funding from Congress is enabling Feed the Future to expand its capability in priority areas, such as helping small businesses stay afloat and undertaking new analytical work to better understand COVID-19's evolving impacts on food security and nutrition in developing countries. However, given the rapid, rapidly expanding scope of the pandemic, we will still need additional support to meet the full scope of this challenge. There is still a lot to learn about COVID-19's unfolding effect on food security and nutrition, but we do know that the repercussions will be felt for years to come, long after the pandemic subsides. Today's discussion cannot be more timely.
The development landscape will change in substantial ways, certainly in terms of food security, humanitarian impacts, and every other sector USAID touches. We'll examine all of our investments around the world and devise a plan of action to assure they are aligned with the post-COVID world. In doing so, we will seek guidance from BIFAD and the larger universities and civil society organizations it engages as key partners to inform our thinking and strategy on how to best address the second and third order impacts of a world challenged by COVID-19, including food insecurity and malnutrition, and to further and foster self-reliance going forward. I value the role of BIFAD in convening these types of discussions and bringing forward solutions from academia and beyond. Swift action is needed to protect our development gains and to prevent backsliding. We can only do that with the type of insightful thinking analysis that this group provides. Thank you for having me. I look forward to working more closely with all of you in the days ahead. And, and for those of you who are watching, not members on the board, please do participate. Your, the wealth of knowledge you bring to the table is vital and, and it's important. Thank you so much for all you do. Mark? I'm coming to you. <laughs> Bear with me. There we go. I got back. All right. Uh, thank you, Administrator Barr. So thank you so much for your comments. Uh, welcome on board to USAID. And you and I had an opportunity to visit earlier, and I greatly appreciate your enthusiasm for this new position, your commitment to USAID, and your desire to work very closely with BIFAD. And I can tell you, speaking on behalf of BIFAD, we're looking very much towards looking, working very closely with you as well. So thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate your comment. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Okay, now I'd like to uh, introduce uh, our next uh, presenter. Uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Johan Swinnen. He is the Director General of the International Food Policy Research Institute. Dr. Swinnen will give a brief overview of food systems and food security impacts. Dr. Swinnen. Good morning uh, and good afternoon. Are you hearing me? Yes. Okay, great. Start sharing. I have to double click here to be on there. Uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting me. It's a great honor for me to be on this panel. Uh, thank you to USAID and BIFAT for organizing this very important uh, issue for uh, this meeting, this panel, and on this very important issue and with the uh, very eminent experts there. It's also a pleasure to hear um, Administrator Barsha talk before me and the important messages that he brought. I have uh, just a, a fairly short time as we all have here, so I would like to start with some key messages which I would like to bring. So there's a lot we don't know yet about uh, COVID. There's also a lot we have learned in the meantime. And so the first thing is that uh, COVID is causing a combination of uh, economic recession and food system disruption. So it's really working in different ways. And that means we have to address both or uh, these aspects of the mechanisms. Second one, it is affecting the poorest uh, more strongly among uh, the populations. And that also means that our measures, our policy should be targeted to those most in need. Third is that the impacts differ strongly between supply chains, okay? So this allows us to draw lessons to identify what the vulnerability is of the different systems and to identify resilience measures that we can develop and basically help supply chain become more resilient in the future. We also see much creative and entrepreneurial activities taking place right now in supply chains around the world. And we can learn from best practices to basically make our food value chains more resilient for the future. Then I think it's important, another important element is that we should focus explicitly on gender and nutrition issues in the policy response, because these are factors which are basically affected very particularly by COVID-19. And then the final point I want to make is that we are, I believe, in a transformative moment in history. And so now it is time to move from crisis management to making our supply chains and our food systems more resilient for the future. So let me now spend the remaining minute just briefly going a little bit more on each of these items and uh, showing you a number of our preliminary results from IFPRI studies that we have done. So as I said already, COVID-19 impact on food and nutrition security is a combination of a standard economic recession, things we know quite well, and food system disruptions and things we know, we understand much well, not so good. 
So here is some of the estimates that we have done, and uh, I'm sorry, the Barca referred to some of these numbers already. We estimate that uh, extreme poverty could increase by almost 150 million people as a consequence of COVID-19, unless very significant policy interventions are introduced. And so a large part of these 140, uh, 150 million people are in sub-Saharan Africa and in South Asia. We also know that the impact is not only on, on, on uh, basically on the amount of food they have, on the calories, but also on the type of food they uh, people consume. And so basically we see a shift from more nutritious food, which is more expensive, to less nutritious food, which is less expensive. And you see, for example, here the prediction on the reduction in fruit and vegetables, the reduction on meat consumption, reduction on uh, dairy consumption. In the what we also see, which is that there is, in addition to the recession effect, okay, which reduces the access of uh, poor people to food, we see major disruption of food system. And that's quite different from the effect that we saw in the 2007-2011 period. What we also see is that the impacts of the disruptions vary quite significantly between different supply chains. And these variations are not random. They are systemic. And so what we see is that particularly those parts of the supply chains or supply chains in general, which are more labor intensive, they are more affected by COVID-19, either by the disease itself, which of course affects labor, and by the lockdown measures. Typically in developing countries, supply chains in general are more labor intensive than in richer countries where we have more capital involved, more knowledge involved, more automation, etc., and therefore they suffer more. But also in richer countries, you see that some parts of the supply chain, think for example on the meat processing sector in the United States or some harvesting of some fruit and vegetables, are very uh, significantly affected. And this is of course much less the case, for example, with large scale, large -scale uh, staple crop production, such as grains with combine harvesters, etc. The Here is some of our uh, predictions. We have done an, a whole set of country specific modeling. And here's an example of this. This is from Nigeria. And so what we estimate there is that the economic cost of the five week lockdown, okay, is almost 40% decline in GDP for the economy as a whole. If we look at the agri-food sector, there we see that farming itself is actually relatively less affected, minus 14%, processing much stronger, and particularly the food services, of course, are very strongly affected. And this, of course, affects the entire supply chain as a whole. These kinds of effects, okay, with farming itself being somewhat less affected than the other sectors of the food system, they come back in several of the country uh, modeling efforts. What we also see then, of course, if, is that consumers or countries, governments, start hoarding when they basically perceive that there will be a shortage of food. And this is something we see in, in various ways. We see uh, this is an illustration about the impact that export constraints, which have been imposed, by some of the food export uh, uh, exporting countries, particularly the grain exporting countries, that this having a potentially very large effect on some of the countries which are importing these uh, staple commodities. Okay? The rice markets are most affected according to our simulations. And so it is a good thing that the G20 ministers and the WTO have called for open trade to avoid repeating the 2007-2008 price effects. Poor people's food and uh, nutrition security is disproportionately affected for a number of reasons. One is that they spend most, uh, much more, a lot, much larger share of their income on food than rich people do. Their main production factor is physical labor, so they have to go out and uh, work to earn an income. And of course, if that is not allowed, it is affecting them much stronger than richer country, uh, richer people or households, which have access to a variety of ways of earning an income. As I said already, um, COVID-19 is affecting more the labor-intensive food value chains, which are particularly important for uh, in poorer countries, for poorer households. It is also affecting stronger the public social and nutrition programs, which are important for poor people in particular. School feeding programs cannot continue when the schools are closed, etc. And especially vulnerable are children, women, and migrants, okay, who can no longer go out to the places where they used to work and where they used to get uh, an income from. Here's some uh, of our recent uh, already survey results that come in. These are data from Ethiopia. And then we find that indeed, if we see at the income declines, the households where have a significant, a very significant 
a reduction in income are particularly concentrated in the poorest part of the country or the poorest households of the country. And we also see that the nutrition effects are stronger in among the poorest households, which were already consuming less nutritious food. And here the illustration is the, the consumption of dairy in Ethiopian households. Uh, to look at the future a bit in terms of looking around the bend, if you want. So here again, uh, these are again data from Ethiopia. And we see again that basically services are affecting much stronger than agriculture, than farming, in terms of the GDP effect of the, of the lockdown effect. And so on the right-hand panel, you see predictions that we are making in terms of what the impact is on, on the GDP growth in Ethiopia of the different scenarios of lockdown. And we see that even with a fairly long uh, basically lockdown scenario that the GDP at the end of the year will be uh, higher probably than at the beginning of the year. There'll be some growth, but significantly less than the expected growth before COVID uh, was uh, basically arrived in Ethiopia. I have here a series of policies uh, that have been introduced that should be introduced. I think I am, don't have time to go through these things, so I'm happy to come back in the discussion, but I think also the, some of the people after me will talk about these things. Uh, let me then end with uh, the final slide here, and that is, I think, the crucial thing of moving from, from crisis management to more resilient food systems. Okay? As I said already, I think this is a transformative moment in history for our food systems. We already see now there's a lot of creativity and innovations in this restructuring of the value chains on the private sector, but also on the public sector. There's a lot of innovation and creativity in terms of restructuring some of the public uh, systems to assist the poor. And I think this is uh, very encouraging as well. And so again, from crisis management to the opportunity to create more resilient food system, I mean, that's an important thing to look at right now. We should see how we can use this, uh, this crisis as well as an opportunity to introduce innovations, new ways of dealing with each other to structure food systems to become more resilient, more sustainable as well, hopefully, and hopefully more inclusive as well for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Swin, for that, for that, for those remarks, and and also thank you for your leadership of IFPRI and and to let you know how much BIFAD greatly appreciates our collaborative efforts with your organization and in your support, and uh, we can we look forward to continuing to working very closely with you. Um, now I'd like for us to, to move to our, our panel discussion for this, for this afternoon. And our panel, we have leading experts in food security and nutrition, and, and they'll present some very promising innovations to support our food systems and nutrition. Uh, we're very pleased to have with us uh, this afternoon Rajul Pandia Lorsch. Uh, she uh, will be our moderator this afternoon. Rajul is the Director of Communications and Public Affairs, as well as Chief of Staff in the Director General's Office of the International Food Policy Research Institute. Rajul, again, thank you for your willingness to be our moderator this afternoon. And with that, I will turn it to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Keenum. I am delighted to moderate this segment on promising interventions to support food systems and nutrition. We have the opportunity to hear from several leading experts in food security and nutrition on COVID-19 impacts. And we have such a great program lined up for you. Without further ado, I'd like to call on our speakers. We have six of them lined up and then an opportunity for discussion. Our first speaker is Professor Carl Prey. Professor Prey is a distinguished professor at the Department of Agriculture, Food and Resource Economics at Rutgers University, and he will talk about national and local policy interventions that support trade, finance, markets, and enterprises. Professor Prey, we look forward to hearing from you. Everybody can hear you, me? Right? Yes, thank you. Yeah, okay, great. So, um, uh, Thanks very much, Rajul, and thank you for, to BIPAD and uh, the organizers for uh, inviting me and uh, for putting together a really interesting set of, of talks. I've already used the previews that people gave me to, to uh, improve my current presentation, so I think it will be a learning experience for everybody. So um, I'm going to uh, try to charge through this in my given seven minutes. Uh, and I'm going to 
just talk very briefly about my summary here. Uh, basically, I'm building on what Yo said, that the uh, pandemic has increased food insecurity, poverty, and malnutrition through both the uh, disease itself and also the policy interventions. And in the future, we need to, uh, currently we need to have interventions that focus on the private food supply chains uh, and keep those markets open. open. And then in the, for the sort of medium and future term, I'd like to, to propose that, that uh, this is an opportunity for policy institutes in uh, the global south to build capacity for inclusive food policy making and evidence-based decision making by proving themselves in this crisis and giving them a chance to really uh, show what they can do. Um, so uh, I'm going to pretty much uh, cruise through this slide. Uh, we've also already talked about how uh, this, the sickness disease and social distancing have closed up markets, closed up uh, the uh, jobs in the food supply chain, uh, and uh, uh, EO's data on, on some of the impacts are quite dramatic, showing how much uh, the food supply chain in particular is going to be affected. Um, the barriers to international and internal movement have already been discussed, and also where the burden fit, falls. So, um, excuse me. So, why focus, focus the interventions on private food supply chains, or at least this presentation on this? Well, it's because the, these private food supply chains are the dominant source of food. Uh, in Africa, 80% of the value of food consumed comes through these markets and are largely provided by the small and medium enterprises. Only 20% of the food consumed is produced and consumed on farm, and governments play a relatively small role in the total picture. Uh, the other important point is that, that food supply chains are a major source of employment. 65% um, of rural employment is in the food supply chain, and 25% of urban employment are from are in the food supply chain. So again, if we link that up with some of the numbers about projected uh, losses of jobs that uh, you presented, see the importance of focusing on these chains. So what do we do to keep supplies, uh, keep these supply chains open? First, these are sort of the, the short-term responses, and then I'll go to a little bit longer-term ones. But there are a whole series of things of which I've mentioned a few that are needed to keep supply chains open. Um, details such as clear definitions and careful uh, of what the, the green channels really represent, um, the importance of both um, the uh, not only moving, allowing uh, food to move, but agricultural inputs, and specifically labor movements between regions or sometimes between international boundaries are, are extremely important. Uh, this means that we need to, to uh, not only um, have clear definitions, but we also have to uh, reduce the tariffs, taxes, regulations on markets, reduce bans in the transfer of, of food and inputs to keep things open. Um, and beyond just allowing labor to move, we have to also uh, ensure that that labor is, is safe and providing testing and transportation to, for labor to go where they need to go uh, and help farmers produce food is of, of considerable importance. Second, we need to maintain food processing and informal uh, and formal market operations to the extent possible while still keeping workers and, and traders healthy. Um, and the, the, uh, the complete closing down of some of these informal markets is just not possible, although um, you know, it, it is a way of, of flattening the curve. So training, social distancing, improved health services, better market infrastructure can all be important in this. Ensuring that the uh, functioning of market infrastructure and uh, communications is is there is an important role for government also. And then targeting relief programs in such a way that it, it sustains the food uh, supply chain and doesn't 
um, you know, replace the food supply chain with, with entirely with government services or, or uh, block some of the uh, activities that can be done best by the private sector is important when we're distributing the relief programs, both in terms of inputs and also in terms of, of food supply. Um, and then we, it, these things have to be targeted, as, as uh, people pointed out, to the vulnerable groups, such as women and minorities. Now, in, the, for, uh, in a sense, the rebuilding or the longer term, um, we need to ensure that you know, the, the food policy systems that have been put in place recently can continue to do their job and to prosper. Uh, since 2000 or even uh, before, there's been a, a substantial growth of, of uh, research capacity and food policy advice capacity in many of the African countries, and India and Bangladesh have, have very large uh, systems to do this. Um, but all these systems are still limited in their human capacity and uh, human capital. Uh, often timely data is just not available, uh, and financial resources to go out and get the data or to do the analysis is limited. Uh, there is little input from key groups in the policymaking process. Uh, even businesses like ag agribusinesses are often neglected, let alone uh, women and small farmers. Uh, and then in terms of health and income distribution policies, the food and agricultural policymakers are often left out. So it seems to me that this policy, this crisis uh, is an opportunity to rebuild um, the process by showing what these food systems, food policy systems can do and then uh, that they are worthy of more resources from the private sector, from the government. Um, and from donors. So uh, one of the key things is to uh, include the food policy people in developing and strengthening these COVID-19 policy responses and, and rebuilding plans. And later today, Saweda is going to give some very specific examples in Nigeria about how, you know, some of the things that can be done. Um, it, the, the problem is that uh, usually the food and agricultural policy groups are not included in developing the COVID response plans, uh, which are typically led by the disaster management ministries or the, the uh, health ministries. And they, they really need to be at the table, so to speak. Um, and, you know, filling in these limitations that I listed in the previous slide are, are extremely important. So the role of government, uh, sorry, the role of donors in this is also important, and there's some real opportunities for them. I mean, there's the support of the food policy centers uh, through uh, financing and, and uh, contracting them to do uh, activities that are, are important for nations and for the, the donors, but also uh, to ensure that they're involved in the COVID-19 uh, uh, response and rebuilding process. Um, is is essential, and that can be done because the donors are often the funders of that process. So continued support for U.S. universities and universities elsewhere to develop food capacity, uh, food policy capacity in the South, and support for the international centers that do this activity is uh, is also extremely important. So there's much that AID and other donors can do, and. Uh, BIFAD and the group that are speaking here have a lot of resources at their hand, and I, I hope we can get on with the job. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Professor Prey. Our next speaker is Dr. Jimmy Smith, Director General of the International Livestock and Research Institute, ILRI. Dr. Smith will focus on interventions to support One Health and hygienic markets. Over to you, Dr. Smith. Thank you, Rajul. Members of the board, fellow participants, I'm delighted to have an opportunity to discuss briefly interventions to support One Health and hygienic markets. Those of us who work in animal health have predicted for years that it's not if but when other pandemics will come. And here we have COVID-19. But we are also offered some solutions for some time, and one of those is the One Health approach. So 
So in the context of today's discussion and the COVID pandemic, I want to leave you with, to get my slides going, with three key messages. First, human, animal, and environmental health are inextricably linked and require one health approach from grassroots to national ministries to global health initiatives and organizations. Second, a one health approach, if implemented, can make essential contributions to ensuring the food and nutritional security and resilience, particularly in the developing world. And third, a one health approach offers practical improvements to improve fresh markets without jeopardizing animal, without jeopardizing human health, food and nutritional security and resilience. So those two messages are strong true of my brief remarks. Animal, human, and environmental health are inextricably linked, as I said, and the One Health approach allows us to operate at the interface. We have seen the potential of this approach in past pandemics, in bird flu, swine flu, MERS, and SARS. However, the progress in implementing this approach has been slow. Whilst we are sure about the technical possibilities, there have been huge institutional impediments. So one of the interventions I hope that COVID would teach us is that we need to improve this institutional opportunity that we have. In the classic approach, the institutional configuration we now have, when institutions are confronted with disease, the typical thing to do is to ask questions about what do I have to do? What am I responsible for? Is this my job? That approach needs to be replaced by a more horizontal approach to tackling diseases. And the question should become in this horizontal approach, what needs to be done? So I hope the lessons of this pandemic would teach us that we need to move ahead with a One Health approach and to change the institutional configuration and relationship. The benefits from doing this is, of course, large. As you can see in this diagram, the arches from the golden arch to the left, which signals when an animal may be exposed to a pathogen, to the black arch in the far right, when human beings are beginning to seek medical help because they have been infected from a pathogen that came from animals. This time has important consequences for the cost of control shown here by the red line. The longer the time to detect the disease, the more expensive it is to control it. One estimate that we offered at the World Bank some years ago was that 25 billion invested in the One Health approach over 10 years can generate benefits worth at least 125 billion over the same period. This approach is well worth investing in. But it has particular benefits in the context of today's crisis in food markets. As Dr. Prey has already said, that 80% of the food in developing countries do not come from supermarkets, they come from traditional markets, also referred to as wet markets or informal markets. In the developed world, we call these farmers' markets. These markets are associated with the etiology of pandemics, and therefore they have become suspect. In some cases, there are discussions about closing them. We argue that the One Health approach could help us to improve these markets and provide food in the wholesomeness that is offered in farmers' markets in the developing world. There are a number of interventions that can be offered, and they must be tailor-made in relation to the fact that people, animals, and their products interact in multiple ways in diverse environments from the producer, trader, processor, vendor, and eventually the consumer. These relationships are complex. And in managing them from producer to consumer, here are some interventions 
that may be possible. Dr. Frey has already offered many. I put them in three categories, enabling, training, and incentives. Enabling in what I call the regulatory environment. We need to have a risk-based, not a hazard-based approach to controlling disease in these markets. We must co-create the solutions because a one size does not fit all in these complex environments. Target and tailor make the regu regulations to suit the issue. Wildlife are implicated in the transfer of these diseases. They could be banned from these markets, but all animals are not necessarily a threat, for example. We can offer simple training, for example, and simple technology training that are gender sensitive and offer simple approaches to controlling the wholesome mess of food in these markets. There are simple and effective solutions where meat is offered, cutting boards, disinfectants and safe containers for milk and so on. Very simple solutions. And if these solutions are practically applied, markets can be certified. And that offers incentives to consumers to pay more. Consumers will pay more for safer food. Certification is therefore recognition that the food is safe. And we must understand, nudge, and promote changes over time. If we were able to do this in these informal markets, there are three categories of benefits that will accrue. First is to the food supply. We will make food more available. Local consumers on a daily wage will have access to these foods. Fresh food will be available daily, and producers will have daily income. There are nutritional benefits because these markets offer fresh, not processed foods, and small daily quantities of highly nutritious foods where refrigeration is not possible, such as the case of having milk or meat, is also facilitated. And the third benefit is resilience. Varied and nutritious diets, regular food even on low incomes, well-nourished children, more resilient and healthier, are less likely to be stunted. So let me conclude with the three messages I started with that the One Health approach is inextricably linked to managing these diseases, these diseases. And if implemented, they offer tremendous opportunity to ensuring food and nutritional security and resilience. And practical approaches to improving these markets without jeopardizing human health could be offered. The solution is to make these markets more wholesome, not to close them. Thank you very much. Dr. Smith, thank you very much for your remarks and interventions to support One Health. Our next speakers are going to speak together, and they will speak on interventions to support nutrition, social protection, emergency response, and access to nutrition and health services. They are Dr. Sean Baker, Chief Nutritionist at USAID, and Dr. Marie Ruel, Director of Poverty, Health, and Nutrition Division at IFPRI. Together, they have 14 minutes, and we will begin with Dr. Baker. Dr. Baker, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, Rajul. Uh, thank you so much, uh, and thank you to BIFAD for dedicating this time to the issue of nutrition during the COVID crisis, and thank you to everyone who's called in. Uh, the prior presenters have made, I think, the job of Marie and myself easier because clearly we have a very nutrition-friendly audience. I think as people have seen, I, I want to first share my top line messages. As, as we'll see, the COVID-19 crisis is creating shocks of everything we do to improve nutrition. And any backslide nutrition is going to directly uh, translate to increased mortality and decreased potential of children in the future. Um, at USAID, uh, we have developed recommendations of what should we do now during the um, response period, what should we do as we start recovering, and we want to make sure that all of our actions are guided by the best evidence available. In the um, event resource uh, pod on your screen, you will see the guidance that was just approved last Friday for external priority. 
Nutrition over the last 10 years has developed quite a bit of momentum. Of course, COVID-19 turns everything on its head and makes a lot of other uh, political priorities. But we need to make sure that nutrition is not swept under the rug, but in fact maintained at the table, in place at the table during all the discussions around COVID response and recovery. Um, I was going to start frame my remarks in a conceptual framework on nutrition. Um, probably everyone around the virtual table has a mental image uh, to uh, a mental image of a conceptual framework for nutrition. I'm using the one that is the centerpiece of USAID's multi-sectoral nutrition strategy. What all of these frameworks have in common is understanding that to deliver nutrition, we need multiple sectors and multiple systems to do that. Unfortunately, we're in a situation where every system we rely on to deliver good nutrition is being hit at the same time. We've heard a lot about livelihoods and food systems, uh, so I will not go into that. We also have health systems taking what I call a triple hit because they have to prioritize responding to the disease itself. They need to adjust their delivery of other services to reduce transmission risks. And then clients are either less able or less willing to uh, access services. Social protection programs are being disrupted and can't flex to meet the additional needs. There is a large burden of undernutrition that incurs, occurs in situations with complex humanitarian crises, and the humanitarian response system is being hit on two sides, increased demand because of the crisis, but then also ability to deliver is compromised because you need to also factor in reducing transmission. Um, misinformation in this very connected world has taken on a life of its own, and there's a particular concern around misinformation around breastfeeding that we need to make sure we're not uh, allowing to undermine breastfeeding rates. And I've mentioned, of course, political prioritization has to be maintained during this crisis. And I wanted to build on the remarks that uh, Professor uh, Ray has said, is that we need to make sure that food and nutrition actors have a place at the table in COVID-19 discussions. With that, I would like to turn over to Marie, who is going to share with us some of the analysis that are helping guide our way forward. Marie? Thank you. Um... Thank you, Sean, and uh, hi, everyone. Um, so Sean and I thought that we should start by uh, giving an, a little bit of an overview of where we were before COVID in terms of malnutrition and, and in terms of the progress we have made. Um, so first, we had just a few months ago, 144 million children stunted. That means suffering from chronic malnutrition. 47 million wasted, meaning more acute malnutrition, which is associated with high levels of mortality, and 38 million overweight children. So you can see on the right side that uh, we have made enormous progress in the past two decades in reducing stunting, and this is all the more important for us not to backslide, as Sean was mentioning, uh, because we had a momentum, um, and so we are concerned about losing this momentum and having to start over again. Um, and other important point is the fact that most of the burden of malnutrition is in Asia and Africa. Uh, especially in Asia, we have all these forms of malnutrition, as you can see here, uh, but also in Africa. Uh, what is not shown in, in, is the multiple micronutrient deficiencies that we have. So here we're talking about deficiencies of vitamin A, iron, and zinc that are uh, very important in terms of protecting us for infections, so, from infections, so all the more important in, at the time of COVID. We also, uh, so for, for micronutrient uh, deficiencies, we have 2 billion of people that suffer from those deficiencies. And they're not just mothers and children. They're really across all countries, all people. There's a lot of, of uh, this problem. We also have to remember that malnutrition in all its, of its forms is associated with a lot of mortality. Malnutrition in early childhood is associated with 45% of all children's death during that period. So uh, we are talking about a very devastating problem if we are to lose our, our momentum in having uh, improvements in, in nutrition. So 
who's going to be affected and how? So the first uh, effect will be on health and mortality. And here we're referring to the disruptions in, in health systems, the reallocation of all the resources to COVID, as well as some closure. There are some um, countries where they have completely closed their uh, preventive health, health and nutrition services. So with that, we will see a lot of mortality in women uh, due to the fact that they cannot deliver in um, in the, in the health services because they are worried or concerned, uh, and but also because maybe the services are not available. We'll see also a lot of mortality and increased mortality in children uh, because again the services like uh, vitamin A supplementation, immunization, uh, behavior change communication, all those services will be disrupted. Um, there will be additional mortality also because we expect impact on child wasting uh, because the services are not there to treat children who become wasted, but also because of the economic crisis, which leads to more stunting, sorry, <laughs> to more wasting. Um, the, 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 in the short term, the economic crisis will lead to more wasting. In the longer term, we expect that there will be more stunting, and this can be a condition that will last for a long time. We also have, uh, as I mentioned, a problem, a very serious problem of micronutrient deficiencies, which will be exacerbated by the changes in diet quality. And I'll come back to that, but it's already been mentioned that there are lots of disruptions in value chains, especially for nutrient-rich foods. And so uh, that means that there will be less consumption of these products and more micronutrient deficiencies. There are micronutrients in other foods than uh, the, the, the meat, uh, animal source foods, and, and fruit and vegetables, dairy, and all of that, but they're less bioavailable. So it is important to get micronutrients from um, animal source foods. We will also see in some populations some changes in overweight and obesity, but I will not talk about that today for lack of time. The impact will vary, uh, of course, by life stage. All, this, all the, the life stages will suffer from uh, different, at different times given their different vulnerabilities. For example, as I mentioned, mothers and young children are not likely to die from the virus. They are likely to die from hunger. And this has been uh, said in the media. We've heard that for African countries, even in Latin America, people know they're not worried about the virus. They're worried about hunger. Uh, there are different types of vulnerabilities that will uh, be exacerbated. Uh, we've seen also in the media uh, mentioned that the virus is an amplifier of vulnerabilities. Gender is one vulnerability, uh, but there are many others, uh, and we know that uh, the poor will suffer more. Urban people now are suffering more. Uh, women are likely to um, be more affected in, in certain circumstances. And the stages of the crisis and related measures that are adopted will affect the, uh, the type and nature of impact and who is affected. Uh, here, in terms of mortality, uh, we have some preliminary effects uh, that, that have been um, modeled uh, on maternal and child mortality. So this is a LISC modeling tool that has been used to estimate what would happen if we had a six-month period of really disrupted health systems that uh, resulted in lower coverage of the essential nutrition and health actions, including uh, restrictions, um, in, including reduction in coverage of antenatal care, and as I mentioned, immunization and uh, treatment and, and prevention of severe acute malnutrition, for example. So what we find is with a reduction, an estimated reduction between 15% to 45%, but I'll focus on, on the greater one, which is not necessarily such an overestimate, we have heard that some um, countries have literally shut down all of these services, at least for a while. So if we, if we have a, a reduction in coverage of 45% of health services and nutrition services, we have an additional 56,700 additional maternal deaths and more than a million additional child deaths. And remember that those are not even taking into account the effects of the, crisis, the economic crisis and the hunger and, and malnutrition uh, related to, to the crisis that will affect these deaths even more because wasting is an important driver of child deaths, for example, and the, the estimate on wasting needs to be 
uh, wasting related not only to the destruction of health services, but also to the economic crisis. And we're working on improving this modeling, and it's likely that the numbers will go up by a lot. So we really have a real problem, not just of malnutrition, but of mortality. Um, so now moving to the anticipated impact on diet quality, uh, as I mentioned before, this will result in micronutrient intakes and, and status going down. So we'll have less micronutrient um, intakes and uh, more problems of micronutrient malnutrition. People have talked about the supply side, and I will go over it very quickly, but one important aspect also of the reduction in diet quality is the demand side. Um, the lockdown and the shelter in place uh, have made people worry about keeping their calories, having enough calories to feed their family, so they focus on staple foods and they focus on food that they can, that they can keep at home long shelf life, most of them don't, the poor don't have refrigeration or any way to keep the perishable food. So they focus on those foods that are not micronutrient rich, but that are rich in energy so that at least they don't feel the hunger so much. Um, so th we've seen uh, people report uh, reductions in consumption of, of uh, fruits and vegetables and of dairy products and meat. Also because of scares and misinformation. In Ethiopia, we have information from some phone surveys that show that 23% of the sample said they were not consuming vegetables because they were afraid of the transmission of the virus through that, through vegetables. And the same is true for animal source food, including raw milk, where in the sample in Ethiopia, uh, more than 50% reported that they were not consuming animal source foods because they believed that this was a, the major mode of transmission. Uh, so we've all talked about the fact that uh, hunger and, and uh, malnutrition uh, would, would result from the losses in, in, uh, in jobs and in income. And so this is also what we confirmed through our phone surveys that there are 47%, for example, of rural households and 32% of urban households that uh, mention reducing food consumption because of the lack of income. Um, and they start using coping strategies, some of which can be very detrimental, like really eating less, giving less food to their children, eating less meals. And so we have concerns, a serious concern, about the effects of hunger on malnutrition and even mortality. Just quickly, in terms of uh, the supply side, this has been mentioned. There are supply issues in terms of, of people having access to nutrient-rich foods, even if they would want them. There's also reductions in the availability and access to micronutrient supplements. Uh, you know that during pregnancy, women are recommended to take iron and, and folate, and there are also multiple micronutrients that are given to mothers during pregnancy or to young children. Those are in short uh, access. The access is reduced because very often those are imported or uh, local production is, is impossible at this time. And there's also the products that are specifically uh, formulated, for example, to treat severe acute malnutrition. So to prevent children from dying of severe acute malnutrition, you have those ready-to-use therapeutic foods that are full of micronutrients and provide the calories that children need and those are also in short supply, so that is another way that we will lose children who will become severely wasted and will not be treated. Uh, and there's also anecdotal evidence of reduction in breastfeeding that we shouldn't um, be uh, too complacent about. This is, this is a real problem. If mothers believe that there is transmission into breast milk and they stop breastfeeding, we have a bigger problem because then they use, they use breast milk substitutes, uh, that is, uh, that is made with uh, water that is not safe. And so we create yet another reason for children to have um, bad nutrition and to, to have infections. Um, in conclusion, I just wanted to um, make this little announcement that there's a group of us, uh, Global Nutrition and Food System, the research community, uh, who have come together and would like to invite everyone to jo join the movement, the call to action to stand together to protect nutrition in these times of crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Um, 
so Maria and I painted a pretty great picture of my job in the next few minutes is actually to give some hope that if we have the right analysis that can inform actions that can help us avert the level, the magnitude of this, the crisis that we're facing. Uh, broadly speaking, USAID priorities are to save lives, prevent uh, backsliding, protect development gains, and to generate and use the best available evidence to guide our work and the work of our partners. As I've mentioned, our external guidance is up on the event resource page. I would uh, encourage you to uh, go into it uh, to get more detail. Given the time constraints, I'm going to be very brief. In terms of humanitarian response, the overarching response is how do we maintain critical nutrition and health services, potentially integrate distribution of more nutritious food products, but in a way that is reducing transmission risk. For example, there are ways to modify treatment of acute malnutrition so you have less contact between the service provider and the patients. For health systems, um, again, overarching concern is how do you maintain some of the critical services while reducing transmission. One adjustment, for example, is social and behavior change communication to rely much more on media during this crisis and focus strongly on uh, breastfeeding, as Marie has said. We need strong messages to avoid backsliding and to, to combat backsliding and breastfeeding and uh, complementary feeding. Um, one of the big concerns is that in order to reduce transmission risk, all campaigns have been paused. So campaigns that have led to high coverage of vitamin A supplementation, of deworming, of screening for acute malnutrition, and of course, vaccine delivery. So we're working to make sure governments have in place shovel-ready plans and programs to get those campaigns back up and get high coverage as soon as possible when conditions on the ground are permitted. Um, as we rebuild health systems, of course, we want to focus particularly on the community platforms, which are the most resilient, and make sure that nutrition is uh, mainstream, that the supply chains for nutrition commodities, to which Marie referred, are, are functional. Uh, I will not go into food systems because, in fact, my predecessors have done a great job of covering the priorities of food systems. What I would reemphasize is the need to be particularly vigilant on the diets of infants and young kids and moms, lactating and pregnant moms. I would like to call out a specific focus on large-scale food fortification, both during this response to make sure there's not backsliding. We've seen had some anecdotal reports of governments in wanting to make it more palatable to industries have stopped with enforcing uh, fortification mandates. In fact, we should look at other ways to make that. And going forward, really double down on fortification, which ensures micronutrient security in those staples, which are the most stable part of the food system. Um, and then I would finally call out social protection programs. With these increases in poverty that are projected, it's likely social protection programs are going to have to be strengthened and potentially expand. And as we build them, to shape them in a way that is ensuring that we get a high prioritization of uptake of nutritious foods and health and nutrition services. So in, in closing, I do think that with good analysis, guiding our actions and maintaining the political will and making sure that the food and nutrition partners have a place at the table in the COVID-19 discussions, we can ensure that the legacy of this pandemic is not a generation of children who've lost their lives and their potential to the pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Baker and Dr. Royal. We have two more speakers before we come to the discussion with BIFAD members. We are running a little over time, so I'll ask our next speakers to manage their time within the seven minutes each. Our next speaker is Professor Saveda Liverpool Tassi. She is Associate Professor at the Department of Agricultural Food and Resource Economics at Michigan State University. She will be sharing perspectives on interventions in Nigeria. Professor Liverpool Tassi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, um, Rajul, and um, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me and uh, BIFAT for putting on this event. It's really a great privilege to have the opportunity to share some of the findings from ongoing work that we have been engaged in in Nigeria, studying food supply um, chains, and particularly to respect, um, reflect on some of the COVID-19 responses. I do want to acknowledge that this work has been supported with funds from Feed the Future Food Security Policy Innovation Lab in Nigeria. 
I'm, I do want to start off by making a couple of a summary of some of the key findings from our work. And the first is that in response to COVID-19 in Nigeria, there were a series of well-intentioned interventions that actually varied sometimes significantly across the three levels of government, the federal, the state, across Nigeria's 36 states, and then the sub-state level. And I think that these could have been better designed and coordinated to um, create a lot of opportunities for learning, as well as to leverage on some of the existing synergies between the different units. And I think going forward, there has been some efforts to improve on the coordination, and I would like to see more of that, as well as incorporation of bro um, broader stakeholders, including the researchers and including people um, in the nutritionists. Um, the second point, which is really my main point today, is the importance of recognizing the complex nature of food supply chains in the design of implementations and interventions in response to a shock or a pandemic like COVID-19. So I'm terming this the need for having adequate attention being paid to what I'm calling the essential non-essentials. And what I mean by the essential non-essentials are those activities which are considered non-essential and thus in many of the policies were not exempt and thus were restricted in operation, but which are actually critical for the effective operation of food supply chains. And I'm talking about my consideration of these essential non-essentials ranges from instances where there wasn't adequate attention paid to the actual transportation needs of a lot of the economic agents in Nigeria, including those who are considered essential, such as the farmers, the traders, and or the health workers, to the fact that in many of the states or in many of the interventions, important input suppliers, both for crop and animal production, as well as input supplies for manufacturing and processing of food were often also not considered essential, but disruption to their activities had a spillover direct negative effect on the operation of a lot of the food agents, including those that were considered essential. Thus, my call for us to always pay attention to these essential, non-essential. A quick summary of an important premise for my presentation today has already been made by several others, which is the critical role of markets, right? So according to nationally representative data from Nigeria, um, the share of consumption that is purchased is really high, even in rural areas where it's almost 80%. So this shows that any shock to markets and to the operation of food supply chains is going to have direct effects on food security and nutrition because it's going to have a direct effect on access to food, the supply side, what's available, the price, and the quality, but it's also going to have a significant effect on the demand side through the livelihoods because you have so many millions of individuals engaged in small and medium scale enterprises all along these supply chains, including the farmers. Nigeria recorded its first case of COVID-19 on February 27th, and then in the month of March, there were a series of government orders. There was a um, federal mandated uh, lockdown, which started on March 30th in Lagos, which was the epicenter of the pandemic, and then Ogun, which is neighboring to Lagos, and then the federal capital territory, Abuja. Several other states across Nigeria also instituted their own lockdowns with varying degrees of restriction. The findings I'm presenting today are actually drawing from ongoing work that we have been engaged with um, colleagues across um, various Nigerian universities since 2017, 2018, studying the chicken maize supply chain. We have, we, through um, our collaborative efforts, we collected information from representative samples of economic agents along the nodes of the value chain that you see in the diagram there. That enabled us to understand the structure of the um, chicken maize supply chain and was able to inform on what some of these likely impacts um, are for and then guided the questions that we are asking in the supplemental data, which I'll be referring to, which is based on monthly calls with actors along this value chain since the pandemic started to document the effect of COVID-19 on their activities. And the chicken maize supply chain in Nigeria, I think is also a good example because it reflects a lot of the importance of markets that I, I mentioned earlier. It engages over 1 million people directly, not to talk of those that are indirectly affiliated with it. It is highly commercialized with over 80% of the poultry products consumed in Nigeria going through food supply chains. Over 75% of our chicken farmers in our sample are actually buying feed, even the small ones. Similarly, among the maize farmers, they're buying inputs, they're engaging with the market. We also have high share of the role of logistics in the trading of commodities like maize, which 80% of which is transported through third-party logistics. 
And so whilst I'm going to be focusing on the poultry value chain, I think that our findings are, can be broadly applicable across many other commodity value chains in Nigeria. So the first thing I want to talk about in terms of the variation in policy interventions has to do with the restriction of trading activities. So according to the federal mandate, food markets and food producers and traders were considered essential workers, or these were considered essential services. However, the implementation of the lockdown actually varied significantly across the country. I'm just going to focus on uh, two examples to make a point. The first was that in the southern part of Nigeria, in one of the states called Edo, the state, the government actually never closed down the market. What they did was that in March, when the pandemic started, they engaged in certain fumigation activities in a lot of the urban markets, and then they moved the urban market, they moved the traders from the urban market to secondary schools that were closed, and then tried to promote social distancing. But they allowed the market to operate every day. However, in many other states, including the um, Abuja, there was actually restriction in the number of days and hours for trading activities. In the month of April, for example, wet markets were only allowed to be open between um, 8 and 6 p.m. on Wednesdays and Saturdays. So these variation, and particularly the restriction of trading activities, have a couple of implications. One is that, of course, it reduced trading activities, which had a direct effect on the income of a lot of these traders many of whom depend on their income from their daily sales to actually meet their household needs. And so they were directly affected negatively. But at the same time also, you had a situation where those who were engaged in the sale of perishables faced significant declines in the quality of their products because if you're selling on Wednesday and can't sell until Saturday and don't have good storage, then the quality of those vegetables or they is going to decline. They might even get spoiled. On the other hand, you also had a situation where by restricting movement and restricting the commercial activity in the wet market to these time periods on these restricted days, you had a lot more people concentrated in these wet markets, thus actually increasing the probability for the transmission of the virus. And then I want to go to my, uh, my main point, like I mentioned, about the effect of not addressing the essential non-essentials. And these are preliminary results coming from our um, discussions with the actors along the value chain. And I want to show the variation across states or country, uh, states of the country, so states. So we are doing work in Kaduna, and in Kaduna, feed sellers were not considered as essential. And so according to our respondents, majority of them mentioned that in the month of April, they saw significant decline in their um, earnings from the inability to sell or only able to sell eight days in the month. And that effect not only directly affected them, but numerous of our respondents who were chicken hatcheries, fish hatcheries, chicken farmers, fish farmers also mentioned that they face significant challenges in being able to access feed for their poultry or for their fish. And they also mentioned that um, they face significant challenges actually even getting transportation to be able to go and um, pick up or to be able to collect these items. On the other hand, in the southern part of Nigeria, in Oyo State, which is another of our uh, study sites, feed was actually considered an essential service. However, in majority of our respondents, over 90% of them complained about facing issues with logistics and transportation in trying to secure their inputs. And the uh, maize farmers and some of the feed sellers, we aggregated the, ch the change in prices on average. And actually, maize and soybean prices between the end of March and early April and May increased significantly by about 40% and 35% respectively. Similarly, we found out that maize farmers are reporting having increased costs or limited availability of their inputs because of the high cost of transporting the inputs from peri-urban or urban areas to the rural areas, and also um, challenges faced um, getting their products from the rural areas to the urban areas. Similar um, challenges articulated by some of the processors was the fact that they weren't able to get packaging materials, charcoal, and other inputs which are critical for their operation. And so this leads me to my conclusions. I think that, yes, we have to think about safety first, but we really need to um, remember not to forget the essential non-essentials. We need to do all that we can to keep agri-food, small and medium-scale enterprises that are engaged in the production of food, processing of food, delivery of food, and which are employing millions of Nigerians active. We need to minimize distortion to their activities, minimize unnecessary imposition of costs. In a post-COVID era, we need to find ways to support them to minimize having to lay off their workers or to minimize them having to close their businesses because of having to comply with lockdown orders or even the requirements of being able to open up their activities. 
I think that support for these activities that can incentivize them to, um, to upgrade their practices would be helpful. And then for those that are more informal, improving the infrastructure in the web market, allowing them to trade, but then creating opportunities for there to be water, for washing hands, more information about the health and safety needs, and provision of um, the PPE so that they can keep themselves safe. I do think that there's also need for more coordination in the response to the pandemic. Like I mentioned, now the federal government and the state government and local governments are interacting. We need to have more involvement of the private sector as well as research in that conversation to guide the, the, the post COVID responses. I do think that we also need to have more data and evidence from research. We need this to better understand these complexities of food supply chains to be able to support government and donor interventions, as well as the COVID response generally, and also in this event of a future crisis. We need a lot of research to be able to guide how we ensure that the food systems and food supply chains going forward are going to be more resilient, and how we protect the incomes of those who are managing them. And the last thing I would say is that we need to engage local researchers in these activities, and I think that innovation labs like the Food Security Policy Research for Capacity Influence and the Nigeria Agricultural Policy Project are among many that are engaging with Nigerian researchers to do just that, as we did in this, um, in this study. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Liverpool Tassi. Our last speaker is Dr. Maximo Torero, Chief Economist at FAO. He will share insights on linking agricultural growth and resilience outcomes for long-term recovery. Uh, Dr. Torero, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you very much to BFAT and USAID for this invitation. Uh, the coronavirus pandemic uh, has been a crushing one-two punch to the global economy, as it delivers a dual shock to supply and demand in quick succession. It is a serious threat to food security because even though there is enough food, and let me repeat, there is enough food for everyone in the world, it is not a given that people will have access to it. The first job, which is what I represent in the graph in the left-hand side, was the disruption of the global food supply chain. Food has to move from where it's produced to where it is needed. Fortunately, and thanks to the effort of our farmers and workers across the food supply chain, the supply chains have been moving. If with delays created by logistical bottlenecks, which are now being sold or in the process of being sold. The second blow, which is my graph at the right-hand side, is a global recession, surging job losses, means that people are losing income to buy food. It could trigger a food crisis induced by lack of income rather than high food prices. In April, the International Monetary Fund estimated that the global economy will shrink in 3% in 2020. To put this in perspective, the world economy didn't contract at all during the 2007-2008 financial crisis. In May, the IMF said that the growth forecast could be slashed further. As we enter June, it seems likely that the global growth will drop at least 5%, if not more. Even before the pandemic, hunger was worsening with 821 million people not having enough food. If the world economy contracts 5 to 10% between 38.2 million people and 80.3 million people in countries that are re rely on, on food imports, could be added to the count. And if we look at the overall countries in the world, it will be between 100 to 120 million people going to undernourishment. The ranks of the hungry will expand in the poorest and most unequal regions. It will exacerbate economic inequality, which in turn will worsen hunger. Clearly, this, the situation is more complex. And here we show what we call measuring the invisible. Because first, we know in the orange circles where the food crisis countries are, and which countries are in ITC3 or higher, or how much millions of people are, are under that situation. But what we don't know is where the new hotspots of hunger will come, and that's what we call the invisible. So it's essential that we measure them and we identify them. We did an effort here to try to look at the different mechanisms of transmission because of COVID-19 in the country. And with that, we rank them in the blue color in the map, the ones that are at higher risk to the lower risk, the darker the blue, the higher risk, the lighter the blue, the lower the risk. And you will see even in Africa, where there is most of the food crisis countries, still there are countries in dark blue which will be affected. But in South America, the case of Brazil is, is to caught our attention, even the case of Peru, and also in Eastern Europe and in Asia. So measuring the invisible is the first thing that we need to do. We need to identify ways in which we can measure them. And FAO is trying to develop and deploy the food insecurity experience scale across 100 countries in the world 
to be able to identify where these new hotspots are, because we normally are only measuring where the food crisis countries are. It's also important to understand that many people will lose their jobs. And just looking at the food systems and looking at all the sectors within the food systems that generate 1 billion point two eight jobs and affect 3 billion livelihoods, we know now that 451 million jobs are at risk. Formal jobs, I am not including informal jobs, and this implies 1 billion people being affected in their livelihoods. Now, where are these problems? And again, this is important to target what we do. The major problems are in the food processing, 60% of the jobs will be at risk, in the food services, 60%, in the distribution of services, 60%. In the primary production, it's only 21.26%. So again, let's think carefully how to target so that we can make and bring solutions to the problem we're trying to achieve. So governments must focus their efforts, but we need to understand something which is important and what we call the triology of health food development triology. Why we call the health food development triology? Because up to now, we have been in a lockdown process by decree, but we have not resolved the problem. We are still in a significant problem, and we are still with COVID-19 present. And if we move and start our economic activity without taking care of the health issue, we will be moving from a decree lockdown to a health lockdown. And that's important in our food systems, and that's something that we need to carefully, carefully assess and to carefully be looking at it. Now, what we can do in this triology? The first thing is to look at the immediate needs of the most vulnerable populations. And several things have been already reached here. But we need to change, change a little bit the way we are thinking here, because food will be available. The problem is that food will be lost in the field, because it will not be exported. We will have more fruits, for sure, but they won't be exported, and they will be in local markets, or they will be thrown to waste. So we need to find ways to create a linkage to the market and to be able to bring that food into the safety net mechanism into, into helping the poorest. The U.S. has implemented that. They have a mechanism in which they are providing support to farmers so that they can package the, the food and give it to the food bank so that they can be distributed to the most needed. And we need to keep bringing these innovative ideas because that will allow us to resolve one of the major problems we face today. And again, we need to look at opportunities. And one of the major problems we are facing today is that the cost of healthy diets are too expensive for the poor. In these two maps, I show on the left-hand side what is the cost of energy-sufficient diet compared with the international poverty line. Most countries can have access to that. But this creates the other forms of malnutrition, overweight and obesity. If we move to, to a healthy diet, we can see that most of the people, poor people in the world, won't be able to act to this diet. And again, if we take this, this problem as an opportunity and we find mechanisms, to distribute the food that is not going to be exported because of the recession, the healthy food, the fruits, vegetables, and so on, it could be an opportunity that we need to take an advantage. Also, we need to start working clearly with the smallholders, and we need to find ways to enhance their productivity. They are the ones that are affected. They are the ones that are facing liquidity problems today, and we need to help to resolve those liquidity problems. And here we can bring also innovative ideas, like, for example, giving them loans with a guarantee from the central bank that will allow to reduce the risk. The large farmers will be able to access that liquidity, even through their providers, but the smallholders won't be able. And we need to find ways to do that. We need to find ways to assure that they will have liquidity so that they can plan for the next season to avoid having a problem of scarcity of food on the next season. We need to remove all artificial constraints, and we need to start promoting e-commerce. That's essential for what we are doing. Also, we need to think carefully. We can use the crop calendars to identify when it can be harvested and when you can plant. But if we make farmers in Africa to harvest, we need to assure that they have a storage facility. And we're doing an effort to bring together uh, all the technology that we have to optimize the location of the storage facilities, cooling facilities and drying facilities, so that when we overlap the production of vegetables and the production of livestock, the storage facilities are there, which are closest to the market, and will allow us to optimize the market location. This is an investment that will pay for the future. It's an investment that will could be having some losses next year, but in the future, we will create significant pay, uh, returns and will assure also food safety in the future. One other point which is really important is trade and access to markets. Why is it so important? We have been seeing that at the beginning, there were some trade restrictions. Thank God those are being removed now. And basically, we don't have problems to trade at this point. But we need to keep increasing the trade access. We need to increase how we access to markets. And one option for this recession is to create additional demand. And that's where we need to impose 
intra-regional trade. That's extremely important. And in Africa, for example, the major problem is non-tariff measures. Despite they have an agreement of intra-regional trade, non-tariff measures are huge. And those are the result of food safety issues. And here is where we can take another opportunity and build together the Pan-African Food Safety Agency that will assure to minimize those trade-offs. So again, creating an additional demand through trade is an essential point to take over. Finally, let's see what is before and after. This is a meat production plant before. This is how it looks today. Still, we have a problem here. The, 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 the producers, the processors, are too close to each other. We need to change the logistics in the processing plant, in the packaging plant. There needs to be an effort. We also need to understand that robotics is coming even faster than it was coming already. And we need to be prepared for this because this new velocity will affect labor. And we need to retrain our labor force to avoid a conflict with unemployment. Also, we need to understand that vegetables will be grown closer now. This is the commodity that I can grow closer because of controlled environments, horizontal farming. Fruits and, and animals and, and cattle and meat cannot. I need to have it across the year, and agriculture is seasonal. But with controlled environments, vegetables can be grown closer, and that's what will be happening in the future. And finally, automatization will come. And we are already seeing the processing plants being automatized in, in Europe, for example, and in some parts of the U.S. And e-commerce will be the option, and we need to find ways to optimize it. In Africa, this is really possible, and it's already starting in Latin America, too. We need to, this will accelerate, and we need to find ways to facilitate that so that everybody can access to that. So again, our future is difficult, but we need to accelerate the change, and we need to look at this as opportunities, and trying to understand that the problem is not of food availability, it's of food access. And we need to avoid having a problem of food availability. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Torero. We have heard from six speakers. We move now into the part of the program that uh, is dealing with um, our discussion with BIFAD members. We have about seven minutes or so for discussion. Let me do this. I'd like to hear from each of the BIFAD members if they have a question or a comment. And I'll go in the following order. Let me begin with Pamela Anderson. Dr. Anderson, any question or comment from your side? Um, yes, uh, thank you, Rajul. Um, I'd like to thank all of the speakers. Those were absolutely excellent presentations, very informative. And I'd like to direct a question to Sean Baker. Um, Sean, one of the really positive outcomes from the last major shock that we saw, the 2007-2008 grain price crisis, was that we saw donors and governments really picking up and focusing on and investing in nutrition. Now, you and Marie have laid out really clearly for us today that we've got multiple systems that are failing, and these are the systems that we need to drive nutritional outcomes. So we're risking losing not only the forward political momentum that you talked about, but also backsliding in terms of what we've gained over the last decade. So my concrete question to you is, what have you actually seen? I mean, what are concrete measures, efforts that policymakers and donors are taking into account so that these impacts on nutrition can be mitigated? Um, what are they? Where are they? And then how do we work together, not just as USAID, but as a broader donor and development community to basically elevate the nutritional concern so that we don't backslide? Thank you very sure. much, Dr. Anderson. Sean, please hold for a moment. Let me take several of the BIFAD members, and then we come back, OK? Um, let me take Mr. Ash next. Mr. Ash, any question or comments from you? Yes, thank you. And I echo uh, Pamela's thanks to the, to the presenters. Uh, my question is really one for the record. We've heard um, that there is a need to better understand how essential and non-essential elements of the economy and the markets work together and what needs to fall into which category. Um, we've heard that there may be differences in the way that uh, the, the positive impact that direct consumer stimulus aid may have versus aid to structural elements of the markets. And so my really statement for the record is, can we begin to create some sort of baseline lingua franca um, using unfortunately, the lessons we will learn from this pandemic to, to create a pathway um, that, can be, uh, that can be studied, that can be learned, that can be interpreted, and then can be delivered when we face these crises in the future, and can and how can 
the various universities, private, public sector, and governments work together to have some sort of across the board, sensitive to local cultural and local market economies plan or blueprint that at least on a limited basis can address a very systemic baseline, here's the things that really need to be done and have worked by studying the things that are being done, the very creative things that are being done in response to the current pandemic. So no one needs to answer that question today. I place it in the record so that BIFED can consider in the future ways to help USAID address that issue. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Ash. Thank you for that important question that merits a larger discussion. Let me come now to Dr. Cruzado. Uh, any question or comment from your side? We're not hearing from Dr. Cruzado. So let me go next to Dr. Deaton, and I'll circle back to Dr. Cruzado uh, in, in the next round. Dr. Deaton, any question or comment from your side? Yes. Can you hear me OK? Yes. Thank you so much. Yes, I wanted to ask about growth-based intervention strategies. We've had a decline, and I ask that because we've had some decline in economic conditions that have led to greater hunger, rates of hunger in the world in the last three years. Here we almost have COVID-19 as a wake-up call to what we're doing. And several of the speakers uh, emphasize the importance of growth-based strategies. And it seems to me that those intervention strategies need to be looked at within a growth context. It's very, very critical from the standpoint of building human health, from the standpoint of identifying the appropriate essential non-essentials as Professor Liverpool Tassi mentioned, which I thought was very, very much to the point. So that focus is critical, and I would like to hear more discussion on that if there's time for it. Thank you very much, Dr. Deaton. We collected questions. I will come now to Dr. Ejeta. I'll give you Ejeta. Any question or comment from your side? We're not hearing from you, so I will go to the next person, and that is Mr. Richard Lakey. Any question or comment from you? Yes, thank you. And, and I would like yes. to, uh, to also say thank you very much, Rajul, as, as well as to all of the speakers. Just tremendous, tremendous information. And um, I, there are a lot of commonalities coming between speakers like uh, Carl Prey and, and um, Professor Sueda and, and Maximus as well. And I, I think that what I'm looking for, and I see some of the sentiment in folks that are chatting, is that we have a lot of great ideas where we're bringing together knowledge that's come from the past as well as some innovations and ideas for how to make things more efficient in the future. Um, but the challenge that I would put forth, I guess, is there a platform-type model that already exists that we could build upon, something perhaps if, for those of you who are familiar with GFIN, uh, the Global Public Health Intelligence Network, something along those lines that would allow us to put um, a notification network in that would include diseases, both human, animal, zoonotic, transmission issues and what have you, but also the actions that could follow, very much like what we would use in medicine as a, uh, an algorithm for treatment of a specific, specific disease state. We have a social advance from the notification of, of uh, an outbreak or an alert of some uh, disease or other disaster. If there was something that we could do there where we could have a, a global picture with macro levels of what to be done both socially, economically, environmentally, and what have you, and what the key stakeholders are. And, and I, the challenge that I see in, in my particular view here is where we have, a lot of, um, we have a lot of public stakeholders and we have a lot of small players in, that are working directly with the people on the ground that don't necessarily have their voices heard at a, at a higher level, but a call to action and a call for need from the private sector. And how do we create something where the private sector can be quickly uh, um, be drawn in and plug in and participate and help, and not only in helping to resolve the challenge, but in helping pres preserve it. So in, in helping build seed supplies, uh, storage of, of excess food that's dried and used later uh, when, when there's a need and that sort of thing. Is there a platform type model that already exists, or is there an idea for one that could be built to resolve that? So that's the question that I would put forward. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Lecky. I take note of the question. Let me come to Dr. Keenum. Any question or comment from your side, Dr. Keenum? Well, thank you, Rajul. And I, too, uh, want to say thank you to all the presenters and the wonderful job they did this afternoon. And real quickly, I just, uh, as I was listening to the presentation, there was a common thread, uh, I think, from most of the presentations about food chain disruptions due to COVID. And I, I think it was during Sean and Marie's presentation. And something that really struck me, I think it was Marie who made the comment that uh, the effects of the COVID virus in the developing countries, in my mind, just in my, my intuitive uh, thinking about the impacts of COVID in our own country and across the world, but especially in developing countries where there's not maybe as adequate health care facilities as we may have in more developed nations, I felt like the COVID virus, the virus itself is going to have a real detrimental impact on on the citizens in these developing countries. But it was interesting to hear, I think it was Marie who said that COVID itself is having more impact, the impact that COVID is having in the disruption of the food chain in developing countries will cause more deaths than people who are affected by the virus. And I found that to be very uh, in, uh, impactful. And I, I just, from a, I guess a question would be, uh, where can our research maybe, I, I know that addressing critical issues of the food chain is imperative for us, but also for our, our U.S. universities in looking at how we can address critical issues that are fat, effect, impacted or affected by, by COVID. But what can we do in research to affect food chains, especially in our developing countries? Thank, Thank you very much, Dr. Keenum. Thank you. I just want to circle back in case I missed um, Dr. Cruzado. If you're still there and would like to make a comment, you're very welcome to do so. And then Dr. Uh, Ejeta. Okay. We have exactly two minutes for the speakers to respond. I'm going to ask them to do 30-second responses, please, and I'll direct them, and then have offline conversations, or perhaps BIFAD will organize another forum on several of these questions. Sean, the quick 30 seconds to Pamela. Maximo, 30 seconds on the platform question. Yo, 30 seconds on food chains, and uh, on uh, uh, growth-based interventions, Carl, 30 seconds. Sean, over to you, please. Yeah, so thank you, Rajul. Thank you, Pamela. Uh, the, the short message is I don't think it's gotten through yet. Part of that is because um, the analysis on what the likely nutrition impacts uh, is more difficult to do, so we don't have the numbers out. Thus, the work that Marie is involved in is so critical. Secondly, again, there is, a, I mean, there are multiple other conflations, uh, and one of them I'd respond to the chair of BIFAD is that what we saw actually in the West Ebola crisis is that even with that horrific virus, the impacts of the disruptions were caused more deaths than the impacts of the virus itself, and that's exactly what we're seeing in one of the conflations, that it's not, well, the virus is horrible. In fact, the impacts of the disruption are what is driving the most uh, the, the biggest crisis, and we need to keep Thank that. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Maximo. Any question or comment on the platform? Thank you so much. So, on the platform, I think what we have identified today is that we don't have tools to have predictive power. So, what we are developing in FAO is, is an approach called hand in hand, where we are bringing together the science and the socioeconomic part. On the science part, we are working on the early warning, early action modeling so that we can have early warnings and be able to, uh, to respond quickly. For example, what happened in the locus, what is happening in many other diseases, but also interlinked to the socioeconomic part. That's central because it could also come through recession. It could also come through economic shocks. So we need to combine both so that we are prepared. And the major problem we face today is because when the health protocols were decided for COVID-19, they were put on a silo, and they were not look at the other potential consequences, which is what we are facing today. And that, that's something that we need to change to think more systemic way. Thank you. Thank you, Maximo. Your 30 seconds on research and food chains. Where would you look, prioritize? Um, yes, I mean, I'm yeah. not here. Oh, so, yeah, yes, very important question. Uh, the yeah. in 30 seconds, I think the crucial thing is that we see here okay, the breakdown of supply chains, what we see right now. I think it's very different than what happened in the 2007-2008 food crisis. Actually, I think the best analogy is 
what happened in the in the basically the the transition uh, disruptions which happened in Eastern Europe and uh, Central Asia in the 1990s. And so we've learned tremendously from that how food systems work, how institutional innovations can take place, and how basically innovation contracting systems and so can overcome some of these things with new technology, which is playing a very important role now. And I think that's really what we have to focus on because it can learn us a lot about the potential for resilience for the future. Thank you very much, you And Carl, you have the last 30 seconds. Any thoughts on growth, looking at growth-based intervention strategies? We are not hearing from Carl Prey. Perhaps he's muted. OK. Colleagues, there are such great comments and questions that BioFAD members have posed to us. We did not do justice to them, but I very much hope that there will be a chance for further discussion offline and in future forums. With that, let me turn back to uh, Dr. Keenum for the next part of the program. Thank you very much. Over to you, Dr. Keenum. Rajul, let me tell you, I think you are one excellent moderator. So thank you this afternoon for managing this wonderful session and to all the panelists again, thank you so much for your insightful presentations. It has been greatly appreciated by the BIFAD board. Uh, I'd now like to turn to uh, Dr. Clara Cohen. She is the executive director of BIFAD and ask her to facilitate our public comment period. Dr. Cohen. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Keenum, and thanks so much to all the speakers for the great presentation so far. And it's great to see all the participants here today. Um, thank you so much for uh, participating actively in the chat box. So now we'll be moving into the public comment period for the meeting. So we invite participants to submit questions. We have about 15 minutes for a discussion. Um, and I, although um, it might not be possible to read all the comments and questions out loud, please know that all of the comments and questions will be included in the official record of the meeting, and BIFED will consider them as they formulate findings, conclusions, and recommendations. And finally, I'd like to let participants know that we'll be posting several questions on exit polls during the last few minutes of the meeting in order to inform future events. So we appreciate your taking time to respond to those as you're leaving the room. So let's go to the first question. Uh, the first question is from Gary. Uh, we have a couple of questions, actually, on local and global production. Uh, one is from Gary Alex. Um, he, he writes, the crisis would suggest that greater self-sufficiency would make food systems more resilient. That flies in the face of past strategies to link and often depend on global markets. How is this likely to play out? And then a related question from Carla Brissotto from University of Florida. She, she writes, uh, can we really rely exclusively on local production? That works for vegetables and fruits, assuming that we convince people to eat seasonally, but less so for cereals. And I'd like to direct those two questions to Yo Swinnen and Carl Play, if we can, please. Can we hear from uh, either Yo Let or Carl on Carl those can, two can questions? Add on this. Yeah, I think, I mean, these are very good questions, okay? But I think they are a bit simplistic in terms of the both the analysis and the conclusions. Uh, if you look at which supply chains held, have held up, it, I don't think it's, it's the case that global supply chains have fallen apart and domestic supply chains have held up. There's been just as much disruption in domestic supply chains as there has been in global supply chains. And so I think we definitely cannot draw that conclusion from these observations. The other thing, obviously, is that in general, basically sourcing your supplies from different Having a, a portfolio of supply, I think, is good. And so basically a combination of domestic production and global supplies is probably a resilient way of looking at the future. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Do you have anything to add, uh, Carl? OK, we don't hear from, from Carl. Any word from Carl? Are you still there? Okay, well, let's, let's move on to the next question. We have a couple questions on cash transfers. Samson Opio writes, uh, to relieve the vulnerable families from food crisis during COVID-19 and subsequent lockdown measures, some countries opted for cash transfer methods while others opted for giving food rations directly. Can you please comment on the efficiency of the two methodologies in ensuring access to food during crisis? And a related question, Deepa Tiar. Tiar Garajan from Michigan State University writes, how can nutrition and food safety be mainstreamed into humanitarian aid programs that work through cash transfer modalities? 
And those questions, I'd like to ask perhaps uh, Sean and Marie to kick us off on those questions related to cash transfers. Uh, this is Marie here. I can, um, do you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we hear you. Thanks, Marie. Yeah, so I'd like to respond just quickly. Uh, I, uh, unfortunately, it is not the simplest approach that would be the most efficient because I think that both cash and food are needed. Cash is needed for keeping the economy going, for purchasing, for buying food, and, and possibly for buying those nutrient-rich foods. And food, uh, food um, uh, transfers would be useful for just what, what is being done now, just providing staple foods and pulses and, and food that provide calories. So both food and cash have a role. And, and I think uh, it's easier to distribute staple foods than to distribute nutrient-rich foods that are perishable. Great, thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, I, I just wanted to go back to Carl because it sounded like he was having some trouble getting on uh, off of mute. And if, if he can't, uh, perhaps I can also ask uh, Maximo to come to address that question too. Either Carl or Maximo. Which question are you referring exactly? Oh yeah, sorry. Um, either the yeah, either the cash transfer question or the um, oh, okay. the one on local versus oh, yeah. global production. Sorry, going back to that first one because Carl uh, wasn't able to get off mute. No, so uh, on, on, on the cash transfer versus food rations, I, I completely agree with, with, with Marie. We, we need to have the optimal combination. The problem we have in some of the cash transfer programs, for example the case of Argentina, where they are giving cash, uh, credit, credit card, debit cards that they can go and buy with no restrictions, then that could mean that they can use the money in foods which are not necessarily a healthy, healthy diet. On the other hand, like what happened in Chile, uh, the program that was expanded in terms of food distribution instead of cash transfers create a big problem because it started to create a scarcity, and they were not able to provide the, the food that they were supposed to provide, so they had to stop the program. So again, if we can keep the market fundamentals operating, and, and we have the supply of food available, which today we can, then that will assure that the cash money can be used properly with certain restrictions to buy healthy foods. And that's what I think the, the good decision of the program of the U.S. in the sense that they are bringing the fruits and vegetables into the cities and into the local market and to the food banks, of course, which move out of the market, but that will allow them to buy what is optimal. So, again, we need to try to keep as much as possible the market flow. Great. Thank you, Maximo. I just want to go back to Carl to see if he had um, any luck getting off mute for that first question. Carl, can you hear us? Okay, we may come back to him for, for, um, to respond to that question. I have another set of questions here around engaging with researchers, one from David Shirley at Michigan State University. He asks, the fact that work in Nigeria was done in close collaboration with Nigerian researchers is so important to achieving impact and building sustainable systems for policy and policy research. Can Saweta speak more about the way she engaged with Nigerian scholars to carry out collaborative research and what implications does this have for broader practice? Um, and then a related question from Duncan Bouton, also at MSU. What support do researchers need to effectively engage with decision makers and how can USAID Innovation Labs support them to be more effective? Uh, so, Weta, over to you. Okay. Okay. Um, so, hello? Okay. Yeah, we hear you. Okay, great. So, thank you very much for those questions. Um, I guess because of, to, in, a summer, in, a, in summary, I would say that um, we, using USAID funding in Nigeria, we did our work collaboratively through two main mechanisms. One was through collaborative research teams that were composed of senior scholars at Nigerian universities and then their graduate students or younger scholars and then MSU um, faculty. And then we had research teams that worked um, collaboratively with actually individuals from the private sector as well as from the government on different questions. And then the second mechanism was through a scholars program that was funded by the Food Security Policy Innovation Lab for Nigeria which brought um, several young masters and PhD students from various Nigerian universities to Michigan State University, and there they are paired with mentors so that they take classes at MSU specifically chosen to improve their research um, skills 
and then they are paired with mentors so that even when they go back to Nigeria, they continue to work with these mentors. And I think that one of the benefits of that for all of us is that we have all not only learned together, but we've also been able to develop a network of scholars across various Nigerian universities. And so when we had the COVID-19 shock, it was very easy to just go back. We already had teams on ground to say, okay, let's get together and then begin to leverage on the basis that we had established with the previous work that we had done um, on the stack surveys, with, you know, the value chain studies on, with stack surveys, to then be able to go back and collect additional information using phone interviews and, and, and uh, WhatsApp. And with funding from the Food Security Policy for Research, Capacity, and Influence, we're now actually even going to be launching with these same teams or broader teams from the various institutions that we are working with, phone surveys, to exactly look at um, the effects of COVID-19, but on a broader spectrum beyond the food supply chains that we are looking at. And so I think that by building up relationships with scholars in the countries where we are working in a long-term basis, I think that enables us to have a a, tool, a pool of people that we can work with. I think it also helps to begin to move beyond individual capacity strengthening or um, to kind of more institutional capacity strengthening. And I think that that's, uh, in answer to the second question, I think that that's what we need. Um, Duncan's question about, um, how, you know, kind of how to take it forward. I think we need to be doing this not only at an individual level, but these individuals exist within institutions. So we need to be working with institutions to ensure that they are not only well linked, but they have critical mass of scholars that can quickly run out and be able to do the kind of research that is necessary to rapidly respond to policymakers or donor questions or private sector questions. I think in summary, I would say that that's what we have done. Work collaboratively, build long-term relationships, and now we have a team of excellent scholars that we can work with and pull, draw from when we want to do research. Thank you very much, Soweto, for that response. I just want to uh, now turn back to Carl Prey. He's back on audio. Uh, Carl, can you uh, give some of your responses to the previous two questions, and then I think we'll be uh, wrapping up the session. Thanks, Carl. Actually, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, oh, wonderful. OK, <laughs> sorry for my incompetence with the cell phone. Um, <clears throat> Actually, what I'd like to do is, is answer just quickly uh, Brady Deaton's question, because I think it's one thing that we haven't really dealt with very much is, is this, uh, you know, the growth-based strategies. I mean, there are some of the ones that USAID and the academic community have had all along or talked about all along, but, but we really have to be concerned, I think, about, about the uh, – uh, impact of the, the budget crises that are coming on uh, the growth promoting public sector institutions such as the agriculture research system, universities, and the extension systems. And so it seems to me that one thing that we need to look at in the, in the near future is a similar kind of meeting like this that takes into consideration or retakes into consideration some of these growth-based strategies. And again, I apologize for, for uh, <laughs> slowing down the whole process. Thanks. No problem. Thank you very much for that response. At this point, I'd like to hand the floor over to Dr. Keenum for some final remarks. So thank you so much to all the participants for the great questions and comments. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. And uh, I, too, want to thank everyone in the audience and all the, the questions and comments that have been made. And I hope you, you, your questions have all been submitted. Uh, I also want to thank again uh, Dr. Rajul Pandey uh, Lorsch. I want to thank you again for being an excellent uh, moderator for us this afternoon. And again, to all the to the presenters, thank you so much for this excellent dialogue that we've enjoyed. And also to my colleagues with BIFAD, thank you as well for your leadership, your time, and your commitment to this organization and to USAID and its mission. Uh, I want to encourage all the audience and all the participants to stay in contact with us, to stay in contact with BIFAD and submit any additional thoughts or comments that you may have. Again, I want to thank Dr. Cohen as our Executive Director for what she's doing, and I also want to thank Dr. Rob Bertram, who is the Chief Scientist for USAID and his good leadership in helping us to facilitate this meeting today, and Sean Baker, who we've heard from. I want to thank you for your uh, participation in helping to make the day a success. Uh, Jim Imke of USAID, I also appreciate your role in helping today as well. And to Susan Johnson, who is our senior counsel for BIFAD, thank you. And Jordan Merker with APOU, we want to thank you. 
Uh, Adam uh, Ahmed, you are the technical guru that helped pull all this off, and Adam, we want to thank you as well. And Clarissa Perkins, Jennifer Leopold, Elizabeth Layby, Tyler Wellman, all of the KDLT program for their help, again, in organizing today's successful event. So as we leave this meeting, as we come to conclusion, I want to urge all of our uh, audience and participants to take just a, a brief minute to answer the questions in the exit poll. That will be a great help to us as BIFAD for further discussions and dialogues as we move forward. So again, I think this has been a great success. I want to thank everyone who's helped make this possible. And uh, with no other comments or questions, I think we will call the 181st meeting of BIFAD to stand in adjourn. Again, thank you all very much. <laughs>